We've all got scars, some on the outside and some on the inside, but we can't be defined by our scars. I've spoken with some extraordinary people about how they've become empowered by their scars. This is I've Got Scars, baby. I'm really excited right now to have an old friend on the show. He's not old, I'm just saying. <laughs> That's all I'm trying to say. I'm not, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, we have Phil Allen Jr. on the show. He is a theologian, an author, and a filmmaker. And we are going to talk about navigating historic family trauma. Ooh. Mm. Mm. Yes. That's yes. a lot. That is a that's that's a lot going on. So, um, so let's kind of we're we're gonna jump in there because for many years you have been a pastor. You have pastored a very diverse flock of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now you, you've had this experience with, with family. You've had this, 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 I guess a family secret that's kind of been, uh, passed down, you know, you've known about it, but you have actually taken some steps and, and done a documentary on this. So, so what is, what is this family secret? that this family experience that you've you've done you've had it you've had what is yeah um yeah i don't know if we can actually call it a family secret because everyone knew Mm. what happened everyone in the town really if you were my grandmother's age Mm -hmm. if you're in your late 70s 80s early 90s they know they knew what happened to my Mm. grandfather Mm. um, in 1953 um if my, my dad and his siblings they knew what happened to their father. Um, And so I found out probably as a teenager, I think I finally asked the question, you know, or at least heard some overheard adults talking Mm -hmm. that my grandfather had been killed in 1953 um, by a racist white man in our town. Actually, he lived like three doors down from my family. Mm -hmm. My dad um, and his siblings, they used to play with the man's kids. Mm. when they were really small Uh, Mm. so they were neighbors but he was he was a a white man that apparently was uh some people described him as just a mean white man particularly towards black people um and so people knew that here's the thing no one ever talked about him Mm. so it was so crazy that i questioned if i if if he even existed Mm. i never there was never a picture of him in the house. I never saw a picture of my grandfather until 2015. So I was 42 before I even knew what he looked like. Wow. Um, I knew nothing about about him other than his name. Um, I never saw his grave site until I did the film a year ago. Yeah. Um, So the, the fact that no one talked about it, that was the secret, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, even though everyone knew what happened. Yeah. So it was like this elephant in the room yeah. um, in regards to my grandfather. And I, I, I wanted answers. I needed answers. Wow. So this experience happened and growing up, what, what is this, 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 what actually took place and what how did you guys deal with it as a family you're saying you never saw a picture of him i mean you knew obviously you had to have had a grandfather did you (laughs) ask about it did you i mean was he mentioned you know what what did your parents say so um i think i've i i actually found out more about my grandfather from my grandparents on my mom's side of the family it was my dad's father okay and so my grandmother on my mom's side, she would always say how my, grand, my grandfather would always look out for her when she was young, because he was a few years older than her. Mm-hmm. And he would always look out for her. Mm-hmm. Especially before Sunday, going to church, he would make sure she was good. She'd be like, you, you know, he might see her and be like, you're good, everything's great. Fix your hat or fix your collar or something. Yeah. You know, so he was always like a big brother type of thing. Yeah. And I later found out that he was like that with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was very protective. 
type of person. Mm -hmm. And, um, but with my, my dad, my dad never taught my, actually my grandmother, if you watch the film, my dad said he was 37 before my grandmother ever said anything about his father to him. She just never talked about him. And so 1953, uh, he had an argument with his uh, boss. He, where he was a fisherman, so he worked on the ships. We, we, our town is a, a harbor city, a harbor town. It's right on the water. As a matter of fact, it was one of those places where the slave ships would come in mm -hmm. and they would, they, the town clock is where they would au auction the slaves. Wow. Um, it's the third oldest city in South Carolina. And he worked on that, on, on that dock, on those, yeah. on those river, the, the river and in, into the um, Atlantic Ocean, I guess. Um, and so he, he had an argument and his boss told him he can come back to work. Mm. He came back to work got on a boat with two white guys. They went across the river to a place called Goat Island. Mm -hmm. And it's a very small island. And I think they used to go duck hunting over there or something. And um, the man was waiting with a, a, a shotgun when my grandfather got there. And the two white men tried to hold him. My grandfather was a great athlete. Yeah. Like, I, I, little sidebar, my dad and his two brothers they're probably the, the, the two, they're probably three of the most well-known football players to ever come out, come out of our county. And we got dozens of NFL football players. Yeah. And two of my uncles were played professionally. Yeah. And so my, but the people say my grandfather, the, he is all three of them wrapped in one. Wow. And, and, and people would include me. He is all of us wrapped in one. He was that much of an athlete, great yeah. swimmer, Navy yeah. veteran. So he wrestled away from the men, was able to get to the water or try to get to the water. And as he was getting ready to dive into the water to get away, he was shot in the back of the head. His body was found uh, days later floating up on the, uh, along the river. And um, his death, death certificate says accidental drowning. Mm. So there are people today that actually think that he drowned. Oh, wow. I've spoken to older people his age in their late 80s early 90s and they don't know the detail that he was killed yeah and so maybe 10 12 years ago i 15 years ago maybe i asked my grandmother for the first time and this is all in my book this is in the film grandma can you tell me what actually happened to granddaddy yeah um was he act did he actually was he actually killed or did he you know i didn't want to just go by they probably killed him mm -hmm. when it may not have been murder mm -hmm. and she she was you could she, she visibly got upset mm -hmm. her face her body mm -hmm. you know we talk about scars the emotional scar like it opened up something yeah. and she shut me down immediately yeah and I was like okay okay and I never asked her asked her after that until less than a year before she passed away I had enough courage to ask her again and she, um, she told me, she gave me more details. Gotcha. You know? and, so, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, to, to your point about how it affected us after that, she carried that for the rest of her life. Yeah. She was very self-sufficient. She was hard to live with. Mm. She was a tough lady. She would give you the shirt off, her, shirt off her back. But she was hard to live with. Yeah. And I just didn't understand why was she like that? And then her brother, my uncle, um, in the film, he said, or in the interview for the film, he said, that changed her, that event changed her. Yeah. She was never the same after that. Wow. Yeah. And that, that's really where I wanted to go with it is when trauma happens, not only does it change, like it can change the individual, like a spouse, it can change the children, but then we're not always seeing how it changed the generations. Mm -hmm. how, did, how, did, how do you feel like that experience affected your life directly? Okay. Absolutely. Um, so I watched my grandmother, I, she, helped raise me yeah so 
just sitting in that environment, in that space, it was, it was hard. It was, um, sometimes I use the word depressing, mm. especially near the end. Years later, I could sense that depression over her. She carried a lot of stuff and she raised four kids on her own. Mm. Um, and so that, that translates when you watch that, when, you, when that's modeled for you, um, that translates to how you then navigate life. Yeah. Um, she's guarded. She's feisty. She's protective um, of herself and family. Mm. So you pick up on that. Yeah. Um, then you take the fact that my dad, who his, his father, he was two years old when his father was killed. Mm. He found out at nine how his father died. Mm. And my grandmother told me when he found that out, he was an angry person ever since then. Wow. So, so my grandmother's changed. My father finds out and he's changed. And they said he fought every day, especially white kids. He, would, he, he looked for, to fight every day. My mother would tell me how he would get kicked out of class, suspended from school so much, playing football. He was probably the best of all the three athletes, football players, but he didn't play professionally. But he would get kicked out of football games. Yeah. And then I was born, and he didn't fight people as much, but he fought my mom. So he took his anger and rage out on my mom. Uh -huh. So I grew up in a home of domestic violence. Wow. So now that rage is what's modeled for me. Wow. That angry spirit that, you know, could go off like that. Mm -hmm. That was what was modeled for me. Now, I don't carry his rage. I didn't carry, by the grace of God, I didn't. And I'll yeah. share later why I believe that is. Um, but you said my, grandpa, my grandmother, yeah. my father, that's what's modeled for me. So all that comes with that, emotional yeah. insecurity, temperament, um, feistiness, um, that, that's what, what translated for me. Now I'm learning more and more about genetics, trauma, and how it literally can change yes. the genetic memory. Mm -hmm. And that thing can be passed on from generation to generation. We carry it. We, we carry the trauma of our ancestors yes. to this day. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So those are two ways, um, whether you want to look at it as generational curses, whether you want to look at it as socially transmitted, it's what you see and modeled, so you pick up on that, whether you want to look at it as epigenetics, where yeah. the genetic memory is impacted on a cellular level, mm -hmm. then passed on from, gener however you want to look at it, yeah, it's passed on generation to generation. Yeah. You know. Wow. Wow. And so I'm glad that you're saying that because a lot of people uh, watching, they're like, I can't figure myself out. I don't know why I'm so angry. I don't know why I just, it's just so much and I can't deal with that or I push this stuff away or I, you know, I'm addicted to substances or I do this to try to cope a lot of times it's not just our, our direct experience. Yep. And I, I think we have to give ourselves a little grace sometimes and say, Hey, it's not always just what I saw. Like certain things can happen to you in vitro. Like your, your mom yes. could have witnessed something and it went while you were in her stomach and, and you felt it, the energy of that yes. and, and then you're born into this and you feel you know so i think we have to understand that part of ourselves too that's not our direct experience but it also it's like okay well if there's something that's off you can still do something about it i don't want people to think that they just have to suffer through it and you can't do anything about it but i, I do want people to know that that it's real it's, it's not just a figment of your imagination. It's not just you trying to make up an excuse or anything like that, that that actually is yeah. a real thing. So for you, with this experience, and, and I, will, I will connect this to your work as, a, as 
having pastored many people and many flocks, uh, you've, you've not only worked within like uh, the black church, but you've also worked uh, amongst, you know, many multicultural uh, diverse groups as well. Mm -hmm. With this experience, with your grandfather, how is that working <laughs> with white people? I'm just being honest. In this kind of context, you know what I'm saying? And I, you know, yeah. I'm not trying yeah. to be no, weird no, no. about it, but it's just real. It's like, okay, you know, you're from South Carolina. So how, but with you having this trauma, how, how, it wasn't any, like, what, what was going on in your mind? Oh, 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 it, it's, it, it's not easy. Okay. Well, I have plenty of stories for you. Okay. Let me start with this. Let me start yeah. with this. When I talked about, you know, I don't carry my father's rage. Yeah. I carry residue. Okay. Um, I told my dad once, because we, we never had a conversation about this until a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I said, I was angry at you for many years, for most of my life, yeah. for what I saw in the home. Then when I found out about your father, I was angry for you mm -hmm. and then the more i've delved into this i became angry with him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i'm angry with him even though he's in a good space now yeah so he told me a year ago as i was preparing for this film that when i was in my mother's womb he was this angry young kid 21 22 my mom was 19 mm -hmm. he was this angry kid um, she was 18, turning 19, and he said all he, could, all he knew to do was pray that I would not carry what he carried. So I start there mm -hmm. as why I can even be in this space and not be as angry and filled with rage. I believe God honored, and I talk about this in the film, I talk about this in my book, I believe God honored that prayer. Yeah. That it is by the grace of God that mm -hmm. I don't carry the same level of rage. Yeah. Because remember now, I grew up first 14 years of my life, for the most part, watching my dad physically harm my mom. I didn't just hear it from the other room. Mm -hmm. I saw it until I was able to stop it in their last fight. And I believe if I wasn't there, someone, one of them would not be here today if I wasn't there in that, in that apartment. Oh my um, and so fast forward to working in a space, um, a multi-ethnic space. Initially, I didn't really, I just, you know, here's the truth. Christianity has a way, the way we've been taught has a way of um, domesticating us, making us feel like the only thing that matters is salvation personal, individual uh, responsibility, salvation, discipleship, holiness. And the stuff that's happening in our culture, we don't speak to that, except for the, the things that the conservative evangelical space, except for what they deem is important. Mm. But especially when things are regarding race and class, those things, or gender, those things don't matter. Mm -hmm. And so initially you're just in there preaching. Yeah. And you deal with, with white folks and you, you deal with the experiences, the comments and stuff. And I don't have a whole, I have more patience than probably the average, but what people don't realize is I ain't that far away from, I ain't always been a pastor. Now I, I, I'm never saying I'm a thug and I always got in fights, but I, I got a little bit of my grandma, my mom, my dad um, in me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I've had people call me the N word on church campus, um, I've, had, I've been threatened on church campus. I'll come back here and kill you. I've, I've had that. Um, I've, I've been at a, a Christian college where I was speaking one summer and someone rode past. I was walking around the track preparing before speaking to 1,500 high school kids. Yeah. And they, they drove, drove by, saw me walking around the track and said, get out of here and we're and so I've, I've had more of that on church campuses than anything else since I've been in California. Oh, wow. 
Uh, and then you had the, the microaggressions, the passive aggressiveness, the condescension, the disrespect. But it's always done in a way where it's very subtle and there's plausible deniability. And if I respond mm -hmm. and get ticked off, I'm the angry black guy. Yeah. So I'm, I'm constantly aware of how I'm going to be perceived. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest thing I could say about how to navigate that is you have to have community. Yeah. You have to have other black folks, both within and outside of the space mm -hmm. that you can go to, to vent, to talk, to share, to be angry with. Um, now, sometimes you got to say something, don't get me wrong. Sometimes you got to mm -hmm. say, and you got to, you got to put your foot down. Like I'm not having that. Yeah. But a lot of times, you know, you got to have those, those spaces. And I had that, I had that within from a couple of people. And then I had it outside from mentorship and peers that I would talk to regularly to just help me endure. Um, but it's hard. It's hard. Wow. I never would have expected you to say that. Not you, because you, you think that when you're in that kind of a space, that everybody's on the same page. Ooh. And I think it's, it's really important to get people to understand that just because you're taught a certain thing doesn't mean that it fully resonates in your being. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Especially when you're in a culture that supports that, that, uh, separation and division that that perspective of other people outside of your community people that don't look like you so on and so forth like you can't think that you're not a part of that the world isn't in you in some form or fashion yeah. like and i think that's the thing that I, I really definitely want people to to understand is that there is a full renewing process and it's a lot deeper than i think that we than we we think <laughs> it, 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 yeah. So Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm very, um, um, this very disappointing to hear that you had that experience, but I'm, I'm glad that you're able to connect, like you said, with community and other people that can actually support you in those experiences. So how, what made you get to the point where you're just like, you know what, I have to tell my family's story. Like what, what has this, has, has it been a healing process for you, kind of cathartic for you? Like what, what, what said I have to tell this story and have to do this documentary? Uh, a great question. So a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, I was at Sundance, mm -hmm. um, Sundance Film Festival, um, and with a group, an organization called Windrider. So it's, a, it's an organization that brings um, Christian, they, they work with a lot of seminaries and Bible colleges and um, just regular universities as well. They bring them to Sundance and there's a forum that they have every week, every day. They're in, interviewing um, directors of some of the films. They're watching short films and they're discussing them with the directors and having, allowing the audience to ask questions. So I go to this, they, they, and, and you're watching all the films of Sundance. You're not watching Christian films. Yeah. You're taking film and you're having theological discussions too mm -hmm. about those films. Mm -hmm. And you know, everything in Sundance is independent and it's heavy yeah. and raw. So I watch a film called Always in Season about lynching. Mm -hmm. A young man was lynched or his body was found hung in North Carolina six years ago now. Mm. And so this, this director, she did a film called Always in Season and the details reminded me of my grandfather, his mm. story. So I get back to the forum the next day and they're asking about the film and they have an open, open dialogue with the audience. There's 250 people in there. Young man gets up and he says, yeah, you know, well, I don't really have an experience you know, where I'm from, lynching, we don't really have that, never really had that, um, which I, I would imagine if he looked at history, he would find that he probably does, just didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. He was from like the Seattle area. And he talked about the technical aspect of the film, how it was shot, things like that. And I'm sitting here like, I could care less about the technical aspect, <laughs> the story 
Yeah. I raised my hand and I began to share my grandfather's story. Mm -hmm. And it was silent. So now what I did was I just connected the whole group. I made it more personal, the lynching part. Mm -hmm. Because for essentially what happened, my grandfather, he was lynched. He just wasn't hung, but he was lynched. And by the way, my great grandfather on my mother's side, 20 years earlier, was also killed by white men in the South. So both sides of my family, and yeah, my grandmother was two. Like my dad was two, my grandmother was two on my mom's side. Oh. So two men taken from the homes in a violent fashion. Yeah. And so I shared this story and afterwards, people were coming up to me, coming up to me in tears. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry for what your family had to endure. And these are mostly white folks, yeah. all white folks. And they're saying, here's my card. If you, and a lot of filmmakers are in there. These are people from their film departments are in this, in this forum. And they're saying, if you ever want any advice, any, anything I can help for you, so you can make this film, because you've got to tell this story. Yeah. I didn't go there with the intentions of telling, mm. shooting a film. Mm. Mm. And when I came back, or before I even came back, I called the director of my film, L. Michael Lee, a friend of mine. I said, man, I got this idea. Yeah. And when I told him, he said, I'm in. Let's do it. Yeah. So we came back and we shot everything over the summer and, and fall, early fall last year. Wow. And we did it in six months. Wow. Wow. So emotionally for you, how has this been? Oh, it has been one of the most healing things I've ever done. Mm. Um, I don't know if there's anything that I've ever experienced in church, in a church setting that has been as healing for me mm -hmm. as this. There has absolutely been nothing as healing for me and my dad's relationship as this. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything that's been as healing for him as this. Wow. When he, he's in the film and when he sat down, we flew to Minnesota and interviewed him and his, his brother, my uncle. I asked one question and my dad just began to, I mean, he just talked nonstop. Mm. It, was as, it was as if he was waiting for the opportunity to talk about this. It was therapeutic. Wow. And so when I watch the film, I can breathe. Yeah. Um, obviously, I have never watched the film without some part being in tears. Mm -hmm. um, but to see the healing that has happened with my dad, yeah. to see how it's impacted he and I's relationship, and it's empowered me. Uh, because now the narrative is not confined to what's on the death certificate, accidental drowning. That's not the final say. Yeah. That's not the final word. Yeah. Telling this story is the final word. Mm -hmm. So I feel empowered. I, I feel whole, like I'm redeeming his name. Yeah. And it has been cathartic. It has been um, very healing for me, um, especially the relationship with me and my dad. And to hear other people talk about how it's impacted them. Yeah. Um, my, uh, my friend, Rena Evers, Megger Evers' daughter, mm -hmm. she watched the film and she just, her, her words of encouragement, because it was, it was, it stimulated her. Wow. Because her dad was shot and killed yeah. in 1963. Yeah. Um, but her words of encouragement and how now is empowering her to want to wanna tell her story, because she hasn't really, yeah. And so those are the things that is done for me. That is so powerful and beautiful to hear. Um, and I feel it's so important, like sharing your scars, acknowledging the scars, because the scars are there. They're there. It, it took me six, it took me 25, basically about 25 years to even fully acknowledge, but mm -hmm. then you have to embrace it. You mm -hmm. have to embrace the trauma. You have to embrace mm -hmm. what you've experienced. And I, I just compare that to my experience with my, my physical scars, taking six months just to look at myself in the mirror for the first time. Mm -hmm. And so 
it's one of those things where I encourage people, like it's, it's sometimes the hardest part is just to, to really go there because you don't want to. When, when you have something that's been painful, something that has just been any traumatic experience, you don't want to relive it. Yeah. You don't want to, you know, but it's one of those things where you have to allow yourself to go there in order to heal the wounds because you just are walking around with open wounds when you don't acknowledge them. Yeah. And so I'm so happy that you had that experience. And, and that's when your scars then empower other people because yeah. other people are, are able to see it. They're able to see your experience and go with you through it. And that can give them what they need to embrace their own scars. Yep. So, you know, I really want people to get that it's not just about telling all your business and putting yourself out there and making yourself vulnerable for people to just kind of poke at you possibly or know what, you know what I'm saying? It's not about just being open and transparent and telling people your business just for the sake of telling people your business. No, it's about the healing process of it. It's, yep. it, it is, you know it's just a part of it. It's a part of healing. You have to acknowledge, you have to embrace it. And when you do, you get a lot from that. So I don't want people, yeah, I just want to make sure that people understand, like, like this, this is, this is a part of healing. So that's Absolutely. incredible. Um, what would you say to someone who has experienced a trauma a family trauma, uh, maybe it's something that's generational, maybe it's uh, violence, maybe it's uh, sexual abuse or whatever somebody has gone through that has been haunting them. What would you say to that person who's just like, I don't know what to do with it. I really don't want to deal with it. I just, uh, I just don't, I don't, I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. What would you say to that person? Well, I would have some questions first. I, I would ask, why don't you want to deal with it? I would ask, um, if you've never dealt with it, do, how do you, or I would ask, how do you think you would feel if you dealt with it? Um, I would ask them, do they feel like they're whole, healthy? Um, I would ask some questions to get them to think about it. Mm -hmm. But then I would say, if you have been wrestling with it and dealing with it or trying to, to not do it alone. Mm -hmm. Like this is the time to talk to a professional, a therapist. Um, if you're not comfortable with a stranger, do you have a mentor? Do you have a pastor? Do you have someone in your life with wisdom that you trust mm -hmm. who will handle you gently, um, but not to do it alone, right? You don't wanna be your own counsel in, in this context. And, and once, because the thing is, once you begin to get it out, you know, our bodies store these things. Yes. And they disrupt how we are supposed to function as human beings, emotionally, mentally, physically, it affects our health, all these things. Yeah. Like, we carry it in our gut. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and it could, my grandmother, when she passed, it was, it was, something was going on with her gut, her stomach, and the stress level that she had, not just from this, but from other things that were happening. She was taking care of several of her kids. One died, a couple of problems with the mother, the mother kids, and she was carrying all of that. Yeah. And I believe the stress is what killed her. Yeah. Yeah. She could have still been here because she was a healthy, vibrant uh, woman. Yeah. Um, and I, I would, I would try to lead that person to a place where they can envision themselves being in a, in a healthier place. Notice I'm not using the word happier yeah, because that's a relative term, but healthier, yeah, more whole. Because yeah. if I can get them to see that, then they may consider at least talking about it mm -hmm. with someone. Um, but the biggest thing is once they're ready, um, not doing it by themselves. Yeah. I... 
thank you for saying that. I think we're taught a lot of times to, okay, tough it out, handle it, don't look weak, you know. And it's just like, I even like to say, like, let's keep it light even. How can we like, how can we compare therapy? If we were to compare therapy to like having a coach, like Michael Jordan had a coach, LeBron James has a coach. Mm -hmm. All of these superior top athletes have somebody saying, hey, watch this thing that you do because this is affecting this thing over here. Mm -hmm. So if you don't lose respect for these particular people that are, that you're going, that you're watching, that you, oh, you might wear a jersey or something like that. Why do we think that we are just above that? Sometimes it's a therapist, a coach is just somebody to help you. Okay, move that little thing right there. You can move and navigate through a little bit better and it'll be easier. And I think that's the thing. We don't have to be so weighed down yeah. by, oh, Lord, therapy, trudging. Oh, somebody going to tell me something. Like, it doesn't have to be that. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, if somebody can help you to move something out the way that can make you feel better, wouldn't you want that? Like, if you go to the, if you have a broken leg and somebody puts a cast on you so you can walk, you're not going to be like, nah, man, I'm going to tough this broken leg out. <laughs> I'm going to just roll with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to hurt. I'm cool. just going to keep hurting. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I'm going to walk it off. Like, you going to walk it off? You can't walk. What you talking about? It, great analogy. Great analogy. I say that we suffer from playing through the pain. We suffer from that. Yeah. We always think that we have to play through the pain. Yeah. And a couple of things I wanted to share in response to that. Um, one is trust. I think a lot of people are afraid because they don't trust. Yeah. They don't know what's going to happen. They, they know that when other people have seen or, or they've seen how other people have been treated when they've made themselves vulnerable, so they, they, they don't want to do that. Is that. They don't trust that it's a safe space. Yeah. Right? But the other thing, my dad, when we had a conversation, I asked him a question. I said, he said he was depressed. The doctor told him he was depressed because his mother had just passed and his brother had just passed within six months, eight months of each other. Mm -hmm. And so the whole family had been grieving, but my dad was like in this depressed state. And I said, do you think you're depressed also because of your father's death? And he said, well, Phil, I never knew my dad. My dad died when I was two. And I said, that's my point. Could it be that you have been depressed over his passing, not having your dad, which is one of the ways it affects me because I didn't really have a dad because he never had his dad. So he was never really there to be a father fully for me. But he said, wow, he said, you know what? I never thought about that. He said, you might be on to something. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff I'm talking about. Yeah. And in the, it's not in the film, but during the, in one of the interviews, my dad said he considered me one of his spiritual mentors. Wow. I was like, huh? And he kind of said it and moved on past it, right? I was like, oh, yeah. go back to that. I needed to hear that again, because here's why. I believe years ago, my father struggled with drug addiction. Yeah. I think this month is two years sobriety for him. Mm -hmm. And he just, I just found that out last month. Mm -hmm. I, I never was sure, but all my life, my father's been on some type of substance, whether it's marijuana when I was a kid, to all types of drugs. I mean, the real stuff. Yeah. My father's been homeless for a number of years. So he's gone through it. And so, for, and I felt like years ago, the Lord put on my heart, you're going to speak healing over your father. Mm. You're going to play the role, play a role. I'm going to use you to help bring healing to your dad. Mm -hmm. Not me alone, but I'm going to play a role in that. So when he said he considered me one of his 
spiritual mentors. That meant the world to me. Wow. But he had to open up and, and it had to be safe for him. Yeah. Because when I was angry with him or at him, yeah. it wasn't safe for him to open up. Once it became safe, when I began to heal and I matured, I provided a safe space. There was no more judgment. I understood the depth of his pain and I didn't justify his actions, but it became safe for him to know. And now, and my dad will talk about all types of stuff from childhood on up with me. Wow. And that's what we need. Wow. And in that, in that part of the coach you talk about, yeah. is affirming people with those scars yes yes because like those scars is... don't define you yes exactly exactly i'm so glad you said that and i mean and that's one of the reasons i created this platform is because i want people because i know for me that was my thing is i i felt like i was alone i just felt like i was alone i have like I have these scars, I can't show them to anybody. Nobody understands. And when I cover them up, nobody understands why I'm covering them up because it's like, well, it's not a big deal. And it's like, but it is a big deal to me. It is a big deal to you. Yeah. And not until you, the individual understands for themselves that they're okay, that they're safe, that they can begin their healing process. So when I, I really felt that was my, the thing that actually sent me on my, toward my healing was I heard that still small voice that was just like, Audra, everybody has scars, some on the outside, some on the inside. That was the thing that I needed to hear that started me on my path towards healing. Mm -hmm. And this show is like, if I would have seen other people talk about their scars, if I would have seen other people saying, this is the stuff that happened to me, but these are the things I had to do to, to get through it, I would have felt more safe. I would have felt like, oh, maybe I'm not alone. Maybe I'm not a crazy person over here, you know, wearing turtlenecks in the summertime, about to catch heat stroke. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't have to do that stuff. And I think that's just what we have to do is give because nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to feel depressed. Nobody wants to feel bad. But we have to give each other that space to heal. Yep. And, some, and that's, it takes patience. It takes understanding. And it, I think, like you said, it also takes you kind of tapping into your own, um, your own healing. Because if you know what it's taking for you to get to a certain space, then you can have that much, you can give somebody else that much more grace and be more patient exactly. with somebody else in their process as well. Exactly. Yeah. And, and your scars allow people to trust you. <gasps> oh, you better say something about it. Yes. Because I don't know if I trust people who don't have no scars. That means to me, either you ain't been through nothing. So if you ain't been through nothing, how are you going to help me through this, this fire? Yeah, right? yeah. Or you've been through some stuff and you 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 uh you're hiding. Yes. And and if you're hiding something, what else are you hiding? Not just the scars, but what else are you hiding? So I don't know if I can trust. I trust people when I see scars. I trust people with scars. Yeah. Oh gosh, that's a beautiful way to say that. That's true. Yeah. And we because we all have them. We all got. We've them. all been through something, and I think that's the thing. It's either are you running from it and hiding it. Or are you, are you just, are you, if you're in a space of having embraced it, then that's cool. Now you walk a little different. You're, the way you approach things are a little different. The way you talk to people is a little different. Now check this out for people of faith. Yeah. You can't be a Christian if you don't trust scars. Mm -hmm. Jesus on the cross, when he came down from that cross, what made Thomas believe Jesus was Jesus? His scars. scars. Mm -hmm. He didn't come fully healed, no more scars on the side. It was the scars that allowed the disciple to say, oh, that's really him. Mm 
God did not use Jesus in some sanitized way. Yeah. He scarred him. Mm-hmm. That's part of your faith for people of faith. Because, you know, people of faith, they're the ones that hyper-spiritualize everything. I, you know, I ain't got no scars. I ain't got nothing. I'm, I'm good. Uh-huh. Stop it. Your, your Savior has scars. And if we want to really, God has scars, if we want to really say it. <laughs> you trust God, right? So, so to, the, to my point, and I'm not trying to make this like. No, I hear you. I hear you. Preach or anything. But scars allow us to trust, especially those who are not afraid of those scars. Yeah. They say, I've been through something. Yeah. And I'm healing. Yeah. It's, it's honesty. And part of what I say is scars make you beautiful mm-hmm. because there's so much that you can get and learn through your scars. This, I was a different person before I kind of went through this journey. And you met me before I went through this journey. But you were going, you were starting it. Really? <laughs> I, I'm telling you, you were starting it. I, you were, you, I, I, re, I think I remember the time when you showed your, uh, your scar. I think it was at Brush Fire. I may have. I, I have no idea. I felt so very lost in so many ways. Like, I don't know what's going on. I'm just trying to figure it out. But this has honesty, openness and honesty. I think that's really what people connect with. Mm -hmm. they connect with sincerity and when you're not sincere and honest and recognizing yourself your scars stuff that you've been through if you can't do that with yourself Mm -hmm. then you can't really connect honestly and authentically with anyone else Mm, you better say and that's the truth (laughs) it's just just, yeah it just is what it is it's not to make anyone feel bad about anything but if anything it's just to encourage people to be honest because life it doesn't have to be what you might consider to be perfect and a lot of times we're taught through whether it's through social media whether it's through church whether it's through our our families that we have to be perfect we have to be have a pristine outside appearance and it's not, that's not what life is about. Life is about living authentically. And so, but if you show up lying, you cannot expect to have yeah. a fulfilling life yeah. because you're not walking in truth. Yeah. So that's all this conversation really is about. And the I've Got Scars Baby platform is just walking in truth. It's like, hey, I may have been through some stuff and even if I don't look like I've been through some stuff, I've been through some stuff, but I love me despite the stuff that I've been through. And even because of some of the stuff I've been through, it's all good. I'm here and I'm, I'm worthy and I'm powerful and all of that. So I love this. I'm so grateful for you, Phil. Um, is there anything else that you would want to say to anyone at all? Uh, that they can do today to kind of get on their their path toward their healing? Well, I, I think you said it best just now. Um, begin with being honest with you. Um, forget about what other people think. Forget about even showing your scars to others. Mm-hmm. Start with being able to, I love what you said when I was, for the first time I was able to look in the mirror at myself. I used to do this exercise in my discipleship um, class I did where I would have people look in the mirror. And I said, I want you to talk to the person in the mirror, be honest with them, look them straight in the eye and tell them what you think. And I would encourage them to tell them something affirming. Do you know how many people couldn't do it Mm. in the church? Most. One, they couldn't even look, they couldn't keep their eyes on the person in the mirror. They would always turn away from the mirror. And I said, nope, 
You've got to stare at the mirror and tell that person what you think about them. Half of what, most of what they said would be negative. Mm. And people would be in tears. Mm. Mm. So that idea of looking in the mirror and being honest and being able to affirm or at least acknowledge and embrace those scars, that's a real step. Yeah. That's not just an abstract, what you did was not an abstract idea that happened to work for you. That's a real step mm -hmm. that many people can't take. Because here's, here's the danger. If you can't do that, the danger is you will become codependent on if you go right to someone else, you can potentially become codependent on yes. them affirming you. Yes, absolutely. And so I think, again, I think you said it best. There has to be in the safety of your own space where you can look in that mirror and you can say, and you can acknowledge, you can affirm, and you can begin to, embrace, even if you don't embrace the scars, yeah. at least acknowledge, acknowledge, because now you're getting ready to step into truth. Mm -hmm. Now you, you're, you're truth telling to yourself. Yes. I think that's the place where people should start. You know, the questions I was asking my dad about his father forced him to reflect on it on his own, mm -hmm. right? And as I did the film, it forced me to reflect on my own. How did this affect me? And be honest. Yeah. And, it, and, and, and the tears that came out over the last year said, I've been hurting because I didn't have my father and I didn't have my grandfather. Wow. I've been hurting all my life. I've been carrying it in my body. I've been hurting because I saw my grandmother hurt and couldn't do anything about it. I've been hurting because I saw my mom hurt, couldn't do anything about it. My sisters afraid, couldn't do anything about it. My dad hurting, couldn't do anything about it all my life. This film, before I even got there, I had to reflect on how, how am I? Yeah. That was the first step. Are you hurting? Are you hurting enough to tell this story? Mm. Mm. because I don't know if I would tell the story if it wasn't painful enough. Wow. Wow. Because I could, I could deal with it. I could, I could live with not telling it. Right. Yeah. But it was, it was, it was hitting me. Like I gotta, I gotta tell you gotta this. get it out. Yeah. And right. I'm so glad you did. I'm so glad you did because Thank now you. you're giving other people permission to do the same. And that's, that's a part of the journey. That's a part of the healing journey because you have no idea your pain can truly be someone else's healing. Absolutely. And that's how powerful we all are because God works in and through us. So I love it. I think that's amazing and beautiful. So how can people see your film? How can people connect with you? Um, to see the film, you can, the easiest thing is to go to open wounds, doc, open wounds, doc.com. And the first thing you're going to see is a video. You click on that. It'll take you to Vimeo, but it's on demand, um, to rent for 24 hours. Um, so you can watch it there. Um, uh, my book is up for pre-order right now on Amazon, yes. open wounds, and it comes out February 9th. So we're trying to get as many sales as we can i'd love for it to be a bestseller but yes. we'll, see, we'll see what happens Absolutely. um and then social media everything is phil allen jr instagram is phil allen jr ig but that you know, twitter facebook um you, youtube and instagram are the four social media platforms and that's that's where you can follow me so i either do videos i do posts quotes i'm doing all kind of stuff on on that stuff yeah, and we're not going to talk about the fact that he also is an amazing poet. We're not going to talk about that right now because we've <laughs> talked about so much. But just saying, if you want to see it, go to his website and you're going to see some things. You'll be like, whoa, whoa, I knew this brother was deep, but whoa. <laughs> so thank you so much, Phil. I am so thank glad you. that thank you for sharing your very, very, very powerful story, your experience, and your heart with us. And yeah, I just appreciate you so much. Now, thank you. I appreciate you for having me. That we could connect. Yeah. You know, 